This is Dialogue. Dialogue, a presentation of the Public Affairs and Special Events Department of KLRB News. Saturday at 4, our continuing dialogue with May Brussel, political research specialist. Dialogue, assassination. Well, this week, uh, May, we, uh, we said we would talk about James Earl Ray and the Martin Luther King assassination, but uh, there were one or two items that uh, have come up in the press uh, in the past week that you wanted to touch on first. Am I correct in that? Well, I just wanted to bring up the movie review in Life magazine of a new picture by Vittoria De Sico called The Garden of the Fincy Cantinas. Have you heard of that movie yet? No, I haven't. I've, people in San Francisco and from New York have told me about it. I'm very anxious to see it. And the review written in Life magazine this week reminded me so much of the type of research that I'm doing and what I'm trying to tell the people as depicted in this particular movie. And the movie is about an Italian family who were Jewish who had a very beautiful garden, and it was, their home was a show place in Italy. And it's the story of fascism uh, coming around them and encircling their community. And the Jewish families are not able to partake in the community in Italy uh, because of the fascism coming down. So they invite the other people into their garden to show their very beautiful garden. And then eventually Mussolini takes over, and the movie ends with the families all being taken off to the concentration camp. And Life magazine says the Vittoria Sico is, De Sico is saying that it is a powerful human inclination to ignore unpleasant realities in favor of tending our own private gardens without interruption. And the garden offers its guests a false sense of security. The same harsh aspects of life that give them access to these pleasures within the garden is simultaneously making them more unhappy on the outside. I think of that now because so many people are into organic gardening, communes, doing their own things. I was up at Davis this week where you see a bunch of students throwing their thrills, frisbees and bicycle riding and not caring at all about political assassinations and more into their own tending their gardens, their individual organic or communal gardens. And the thing that has made them turn inside to pulling that rake and hoe and pulling into this small enclave is that things outside are so bad. The assassinations, the riots, the drug problems, the chaos in our country is they get bad vibes everywhere and they're turning into nature to their garden but the outside is still taking place and they don't want to be shaken into that outside world and they're pulling farther back into the garden and the organic thing. And the review of this movie tells how the family is taking away to concentration camps and they're completely numb that they are the victims of this fascism and it was impossible for them to believe it. They said the pains that are close to us, the immediate things we can see, we can, we can handle uh, if they knock on the door and hurt one person, we can see that, or if somebody's taken off to jail, you can see that. But while they're in the garden, they try to avoid dealing with, th with those things that are faceless, faceless institutional madness that affects their lives. They couldn't handle that facelessness, and eventually they all died anyway. That was uh, one of the factors involved. I, I just finished reading The Twelve Years Reich, and uh, he did sort of a summary to try to figure out how did it happen in Nazi Germany. And that was one of the things, of course, complacency. And another thing that he mentioned, another very important factor, was little by little, the masses willingly gave up their political liberties for economic security. And as long as you could uh, keep them happy in their possessions, or, or uh, as J. Edgar Hoover frequently does with his crime statistics, tell them their possessions are being threatened. They'll fight and, to hold and on. And we'll them. take care of you if you'll just give us more power. Oh, yeah, take more power, take more power. More policemen, more, more power, more laws. And the next thing they know, those laws are coming down on them. Well, you see, I, after the political assassination of John Kennedy, and I began to research who was into that, and uh, tried to tell the youth people, or the music people, you know, it'll affect your rock concerts, your pops, your, your music culture. 
um, they went withdrew into a music thing, which is a political substitute or protest don't have that in a to way. Withdraw into it and that doesn't exist anymore. They, that has been taken over. And the gardening thing, it's involved. The movie now is about gardening, and the organic gardeners are tilling their soil, and they think the outside isn't going to touch them, but it will. Now we'll get right on. That's what the hermits <laughs> up in Coldwater Canyon thought too, and I remember sitting in Los Angeles watching in full color television, wondering why the whole city didn't rise up in outrage when they went up and drug those people out of the woods, tied together <laughs> on a rope like an Arab slave train, and it showed them leading them down out of the hills. And the only th they weren't charged with anything. As a matter of fact, it was just that uh, the rationale for it was well, a lot of them were smoking up there, and they were a fire hazard. A fire hazard, and they took them away like animals, like beasts. Yeah. Well, you can't escape. You can't escape the political system, and tending a beautiful garden isn't going to do it. That has to be done. That's something different, but it, that isn't going to solve the problem on the outside. We have to face that hidden government that people don't want to face. They resist what I am saying. Many people, some are beginning to understand, but because it's faceless, it's only faceless because we allow it to be. It, the people have names and faces and banks and meeting places. And we'll talk about James Ray because I talk about faceless governments. On the birthday of Martin Luther King this year in January, they had celebrations around the country uh, in honor of his birthday. And the Monterey, uh, there was the San Jose Mercury had an article about Martin Luther King's birthday that Mrs. King wanted to be a national holiday. And then it goes on to say King was shot and killed by a sniper April 4th, 1968. They don't even bother to say who killed him anymore just by a sniper, as if they don't even know. Well, they don't know. Well, they're keeping the, they're keeping the name out of the news because he's been promised parole in 13 years and maybe earlier on, on good behavior. So, I'd, I'd like to preface this with a remark of my own. I hear it. Uh, an awful lot, you know, why do you talk about stuff like this? It just brings people down. It's such a downer. It's such a drag, you know, and it puts bad vibes in the air and all that. Well, if you were suffering from cancer and didn't know it, and it was curable, I think you would appreciate it if a doctor came along and called your attention to the fact, hey, you've got cancer, uh, let's do something about it. Or, hey, you've got gangrene in that leg, let's take care of it now before the leg falls off, or, or <laughs> leprosy, or what have you. And this is the kind of thing that Mae Brussel is trying to do, is to awaken you to the fact that uh, there is a cancer here, yeah, and look, that it is, is, it's controlling us. And it's very hard to get to the people. I asked uh, Monterey Library to carry the magazine Computer and Automation, because since May 1970, they've had articles on the political assassination of John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King. And I got a letter back from them this February saying that they regret that the book selection committee will not purchase at this time. What I think I will do, I'm going to be over at the library next week. I'm going to buy a subscription for them. And donate it to the And library. donate it to the library. I just sent a subscription to Margaret Oswald. She didn't have the issues. And uh, so if I buy the back issue since May and it's free, they certainly can't object to a trade magazine on computer and automation. Well, this, uh, this magazine, I think, uh, particularly takes care of any arguments of people who won't listen to this type of thing because they say it's all emotional claptrap and this sort of thing. Computers and automation, I don't know if you're familiar with the magazine, but it does not deal in emotionalism. It, it publishes every month an issue on the assassination, and it has listed now like five lawsuits pending related to access to information on the political assassinations. It gives the entire lawsuit it will publish and photographic evidence of other cameras or Daily Plaza. It's a very uh, statistical magazine. It sticks with the facts, with the statistics, and lets the people see what's happening in the country. I asked uh, Thunderbird Bookstore to carry Harold Weisberg's book, Frame Up, that we're going to discuss. It's the book on uh, James Ray. It's an excellent book. Harold Weisberg wrote four books on the John Kennedy assassination, heavily documented. He's a thorough researcher. He used to work for the FBI. But the Thunderbird says to me, well, it's a small publisher, so we won't carry those offbeat publishers. But well, the big publishers won't carry the, stuff like this. You went to 28 publishers, and they won't carry it. So you get one who has the courage. It's like saying that Mae Brussels' facts aren't true because she's on a small FM station that only reaches X amount of people in a radius so far, that her material can't be true. I could say what I'm saying in New York City, and it would be true. It, or David Frost wouldn't let me on the show, you know, to discuss political assassinations. The national news media 
won't touch it at all. That doesn't mean it's not true. It means that they won't touch it. Well, that's because too many of the people who have the final say in the upper echelons um, may have reasons for not wanting you to talk about it. Yet in the establishment news, I mean, there's nothing more establishment than the New York Times edition of the 1970 Almanac. So I'm going to read to you what they say about James Ray and conspiracy out of that. You see, uh, this is interesting what the New York Times has to say about James Ray, and yet if I wanted to go on a national program on a larger area and talk about it, they won't let you. So the, there's a section on page 591 in the Almanac called The Assassins, and it says, in quote, from the dark cellar of the American house, a rare creature has crawled out during the 1960s. He's a strange new strain of assassin, a killer, who's neither demented nor the spokesman for some cause. J Lee Harvey Oswald, Sir Han Sirian, and James Earl Ray, brothers in deathmaking, were loners and losers in life, and these seemingly unmotivated killers do not fit the American dream of life is advertised by the Legionnaires, the Elks, the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Birchers, and so on down. Assassination breeds new low life. Politics moves in with its own momentum. And even nothing stops, even the morbidity. No Warren Commission, no trials without the true punishment of disclosure. The assassination American style is flat, vulgar, and meaningless. End quote for one moment. If these conspiracies are done by agencies within the United States, they are flat and vulgar and meaningless. You see, the men were not motivated. These individual men or Charlie Manson or any particular thing that would be associated with the reasons the, the uh, victims were killed. And the Almanac is telling you that they were just flat, ugly, new type of American uh, politics, which they were. Now, the, it goes back to say, in quotes, this horrible decade of assassination has become the decade of doubt, fantasy, suspicion, because the fallen idols were all honorable men, and as a result, the politics of conspiracy has moved to the forefront in many minds. There is no justice or sober justice, whether killers fascists or communists, right or left wing, the CIA, the FBI, ask these questions. Oswald was killed by a friend of the Texas police, Sirhan uh, changed his story constantly with the help of his lawyers. Ray strung out his story like a cat with a ball of wool, eventually entangling himself as well as the courts. The Warren Commission report, which was widely interpreted as a rush, jo rush job, only served to proliferate new political speculation uh, because the Johnson administration had lost its credibility following news management policies. And as for Sirhan and the Ray trials, justice became tongue-tied even though both were convicted killers and confessed. Ray's punishment without trial, subject to examination of evidence or cross-examination and the accused appearance in the open court, disappointed the black community. And of all the three, the King case seemed to be the one in which there might well have been a conspiracy, or at least a clear racist involvement. Yet there was a prearranged deal between the prosecution and the admitted killer's attorney, Judge Battle, leaving the loose ends untied, and they went along with the deal, treating the assassination of Dr. King as though it were a routine murder case. As a, with a sold Sirhan TV interview, the rights to Ray's story were peddled to the magazine. The first full account will eventually emerge, not in the courtroom, by, but by freelance justice in the slick magazines. Publicity, profit, and politics moved into the vacuum left by the justice denied American people, end quote. That's the New York Times uh, almanac on assassinations. Well, now, what about uh, your own research into James Earl Ray and your own documentation? Um, as I understand, today you're going to give us uh, pretty much a chronology of James Earl Ray from beginning up to the time of imprisonment. That's right. And I'll, I'll give you the name of three publications to read in case in this hour we can't really cover the whole of James Earl Ray. And if you're serious about studying political assassinations, get Harold Weisberg, the book called Frame Up, published by Outer Bridge and Din Free. The second book is John Siegenthaler called A Search for Justice. That is the trial of Sir Han and Ray and Clay Shaw. Both of those books came out this last year. And then Computer and Automation, December 1970, 
Fort Ord Library and the Monterey Peninsula College have all of the issues, and you can photograph the legal documents on James Earl Ray, his wanting a new trial, why there was evidence of conspiracy, what a trial would show, what deals were made to not let him have a trial. That is Computer and Automation, December 1970. Now, <clears throat> in a search for justice, um, the author begins by saying, Ray was arrested June 8, 1968. Martin Luther King was killed in April 1968, April 4th. And thus began one of the most unsatisfactory and inconclusive criminal judicial proceedings in American history. The aliases James Earl Ray used were Raymond George Sneed, Eric Starvo Galt, John Williard, Harvey Lohmeyer, W.C. Heron, James O'Connor, Paul Bridgman, and James Walton. Now, of these, Bob, the Raymond George Sneed, Eric Starvo Galt, and Paul Bridgman, Three other men were using those names, too. They were in the geographical vicinity of James Ray. Um, they lived in Canada just within a mile radius of his home, and Ridgman had been down in the south in the same vicinity that Ray had moved and worked, and Ray had a roommate in the cell whose name was Bridgman. There were two other men using these names simultaneously, but he was using the three other men using the aliases, Raymond George Sneed, Eric Starvogalt, and Paul Bridgman. Now, the background of James Earl Ray is interesting because he was described as being a born loser. Now, this background I'm giving you is up to the time he, is, he kills Martin Luther King because he makes a distinct change in personality. Mm -hmm. He was described as a hardened professional criminal and never successful in any of the jobs he did. He tried a lot of robberies, and he was always bungling what he did. He robbed a grocery store, and in the process he fell from the getaway car. He stole a typewriter, and he dropped his bank book at the scene of the crime. He robbed in Chicago, and he ran into a dead-end alley, and he was shot in this dead-end alley. He jumped into an elevator in St. Louis while he was robbing, and he got a, was getting away from the deputies, but he forgot to close the elevator door, and they had grabbed his coat and caught him. They weren't serious charges. He was never involved in any hard violence or, you know, of killing anybody or uh, hurting them. But it was all petty stuff, and he was never out of trouble from the time he was little. And he uh, always arranged to get caught. It seems like that is a real portrait of a loser, if I ever saw he, he one. Couldn't, he was always caught. He was in and out and in and out and described as a born loser. His parents were very, very poor. He was a child of the Depression years, squalid poverty in Missouri. He was sickly when he was young, and he was branded a thief in school. They couldn't keep him from stealing while he was attending school. He was unfit for military service. He was a petty criminal, and he was turned down for military service. And he spent most of his adult life in prison. When he would get out, he'd steal. He was put back in, and um, he kept this cycle going all the time. Now, he escaped from the Missouri State Prison in the spring of 1967, and nobody bothered to look for him. How did a guy like that manage to escape from prison? I would think the warden would have to come down and show him where the door was and well, there, help him out. <laughs> there was a drawing that he went through the bakery and out through a back door. And he didn't walk out the front door, but he went through the bakery through some kind of a tunnel, and he did escape. But he, they didn't look for him for 24 hours. The warden placed no uh, search for him. He wasn't aware that he was missing, evidently. He was not conspicuous at the dinner table when they passed out the food or when they locked up the cells or nobody looked around and said hey where's jimmy huh? no they didn't look for him now it's a common fact or it's it's common knowledge to me since i've been heavy into my research and it wasn't before and maybe i assume that my listeners know some of the things i i take for granted maybe they're not familiar with the fact that police departments do hire convicts to to commit certain crimes or not the police department persons who want crimes committed recruit they have to work with the warden or somebody to get a man out of jail, uh, and then he is hired to do another crime. Uh, the man who killed Jablonski said that he was hired while he was still in jail. And uh, the men, two men that were mentioned um, as suspects to kill Cesar Chavez are involved in being in jail, and they're protected in jail. We don't know that they're in jail because uh, the authorities won't tell us who they are. That's right, but in my... A uh, filing cabinet where I have 1,800 or more different subjects that I cross-file. One of them is people hired in prison 
to go out and do a job, and provocateurs and hired by the FBI or the police or private persons, and they have to work some deal out with the warden. Charlie Manson was uh, in jail on a 10-year rap, and uh, after six years, he was given parole after he was carefully coached and trained, and then with $30 or so, he headed north. He was down near San Diego, and he headed north and met a girl who was a college graduate librarian, and he was on his way to spending a lot of money traveling and moving around. But he was carefully coached in jail and then the out, a lot out. And specifically, didn't James Earl Ray's cellmate uh, make some reference to uh, the word was out that if anybody wanted to make a cool million... Uh, you could involve killing King. Uh, That's right. Yeah, yeah, the, the, uh, cool million was offered for killing Martin Luther King After, at the time James Earl Ray was in prison. Well, James Earl Ray was in prison. Which may be coincidental, but I think it's uh, It's too pertinent. far-fetched because while he was in prison, uh, the conversation was killing Martin Luther King and that they, they were floating the idea around among these prisoners that a million dollars was available. And when James Ray was arrested in London and brought home, then a cellmate told the media, oh, I remember Ray, and isn't it a coincidence that the conversation was going? But okay, what, he's escaped from the Missouri State Prison. That's right, and nobody has called an alert, and at the time of his arrest uh, for being a suspect and killing Martin Luther King, it seemed that there was no record out for a year and a half on looking for James Ray. The FBI had no missing felon report. Uh, there was no report around. There was no record of his having escaped. Uh, there, no, not no record. And he had crossed borders from Mexico and Canada and back and forth into international boundaries. But the convict known as James Earl Ray was not. Uh, no one was conscious of looking for this particular person or these fingerprints or the, that face. Of the warden didn't call. And then James found a trailer after he escaped from the penitentiary where the door was open and there was wine and he rested. Uh, it was raining and he was safe and cozy. A, a trailer just happened to be there unlocked and Near with, with a nice feast distance. and wine and uh, maybe a shower and change of clothes. That's and, right. and the day before he... He's lucky. <laughs> the day before he, in quotes, escaped, his brother visited him. His brother works for Mr. Stoner of the state's rights party who says, I'm, real, I'm glad that King is dead, and I'll read you some of his language, how he describes. Well, now, um, when all this was uncovered, uh, didn't the prosecution make any effort to find out, for instance, uh, who owned that trailer and who left it there available for James Earl Ray and well, why it was unlocked and why uh, it was so We're handy? talking about something that was very logical to do if you want to find out who is after James Earl Ray. But the question never came up, really. Yeah. You know, now, Wes Graff of the FBI in charge of the whole West Coast Division and all of the Los Angeles area, was up in Carmel at an FBI convention, <coughs> the Holiday Inn, in 1968. And it was right after Martin Luther King was killed. And we had dinner together at Rocky Point. And he's a friend of my ex-husband's. They grew up, went to school together in South Dakota. And Wes Graff was up here with his wife. We went out for dinner. And I said, you could find the man who killed Martin Luther King, if you wanted to. And I'll tell you how you could do it. And I began to list the ways you would go about if you wanted to catch him. <laughs> but the FBI did not find Martin Luther King. Scotland Yard did. They said they uh, spent James almost Earl a million... Yeah. James, yeah, pardon, yeah, Martin Luther King. James Earl Wright. They, they said they spent almost a million dollars in the investigation. I believe that, but it was misdirected. And it was Scotland Yard that found James Earl Ray. But I felt that it would have been very easy to find this particular person if they had really wanted, based upon my past research of the movements of Oswald. Okay. okay. He's now, out of prison. He's, he's found his of... trailer. He's nice and rested now. He's had a little wine. Yeah. Okay. His brother Shower. visits him. He's on his way. So April 22nd, his brother visits him. April 22nd, 1967. And April 23rd, he leaves the jail. And <clears throat> he goes to Kansas City with a Social Security card in his pocket. Number 318-24-7098. <clears throat> the name of the Social Security card is John Larry Raines. Now, it isn't ever mentioned that somebody in jail had that name and that he stole his Social Security card and used the alias. He had provided in his pocket an alias and a Social Security card, which is a legal government document, hard to duplicate while you're sitting in the penitentiary all your life. It'd be hard to print those. But he has that, and he goes to a restaurant where... He's a dishwasher at $170, $107 a week, and he works there from April until July, July 16th. 
April until July. April, May, May June, July. July. Four months. A little less than four months, about three months. He's a so dishwasher. So he probably made a total of around fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars $1,600. We'll say $1,500 to give us a round figure to work with. Well, yeah, 400 a month. And uh, he has his brother is about ten miles from that restaurant, and his sister. And he does receive calls there and visitors while at work. He has made friends. He buys a car, and he he gets buys a, a car. Now wait a minute. At four hundred dollars a month, you don't really save an awful lot of well, money. Well, even if it was you're, just hundred. If you're eating and paying rent. <laughs> well, the the buying. I guess you could buy a used car for fifty a hundred dollars. That isn't hard on your first paycheck. It's a question of when you sign the names and everything, verification of the ownership. You see, he's an ex-convict who's out, and he's escaped from a jail. Mm -hmm. And the legal, just signing these names and buying these things, that, that it isn't the one thing he buys, but he continuously is doing transactions and getting passports and Social Security cards. And it seems to me that that, um, when you add up the sum total of how many times he's wide open for the public, you'd think that somebody would be looking for well, him. Well, anyway, he had to make some kind of down payment on the car. We well, figure. he bought a car, a Chrysler, and then he sold that and bought a Plymouth, and then in July, that's four months later, he goes into Canada under the name of Eric Starbo Galt. This is another alias he's to use. And he pays $175 advance and rents an apartment for six months. And then he goes to the tailor and he's going to get some fancy clothes for around $200 an outfit because he's about to go to a nice resort hotel. Now, where is he working now? Where is he getting this money? Well, he goes to the Neptune bar where he meets a named Raoul. R-A-O-U-L, and this name runs through his story all the time. And Raoul meets him later on Canal Street at the same location where Lee Harvey Oswald came and went. And it, this is uh, James Ray's account for his money, was smuggling dope and drugs for Raoul. He says that that's mm. how he got his up to $50,000. He was dealing, huh? He was dealing, yeah. But it's interesting. The story is that he's moving all this time from 1967, April, until 1968 at the time of the murder of Martin Luther King. And what, Raoul helps him buy a gun, and Raoul buy, helps him buy a car. We'll go into it. But when he goes to Memphis, he's never been in the city before in his life, and he goes to this particular hotel where Martin Luther King is being back alleyed from him. He's never been in the city before in his life, and he has all this equipment and money, you know, binoculars and gun, and he chooses this particular motel, and then he makes a quick getaway against all the people that are surrounding him, all the police. His excuse, oh, I'm jumping around here a little, but uh, I don't want to forget it. His When he left the Lorraine Motel, the rooming house that he had in back of the Lorraine Motel, he left the gun that allegedly shot Martin Luther King, and he left a uh, bag with toilet articles, newspaper, and beer cans, and his radio that he'd had with him ever since his prison days. And the question was, said, why did you drop all that stuff and leave that? Fingerprints and everything, all this evidence of who you are, you know? And his answer was, well, the policemen were at the restaurant across the street by the Lorraine Motel, and they would be outside if they saw him leaving with these packages that um, he'd be a suspect. Now, a gun's gone off, and Martin Luther King is killed, and it's surrounded by policemen eating the restaurants around there. <laughs> and he doesn't want to be seen with all these things. Well, they don't grab him leaving the building that's behind the Lorraine Motel. They let him run, whether he had anything in his hand or not. If he didn't have a gun in his hand, they didn't stop him. You would think if the policemen are going to see anyone come out of that building. And Martin Luther King's been killed out in that balcony. You can imagine the noise and the excitement. The, the, those policemen would be running out from this restaurant, so there were a lot of policemen right at that building. Okay. That, okay, now, now we go back. Now, he's, he's had the dishwashing job at $400 a month for three months, a little over three months. And he's been in he's jail bought, all of his life. bought a car, sold that, bought another car, traveled to Canada, and in Montreal he meets a man named Raoul, R-A-O-U-L. Yes, and then he goes <coughs> to a resort hotel, and he dates a woman. He stays there for seven days where he's wearing his new clothes, and he's all prettied up. And goodness knows what kind of grammar or manners, you know, after his impoverished childhood, you know, in Missouri. He's he's swinging at a Canadian resort, and he is dating and uh, living with, for that one week, sleeping with this particular woman who's the secretary to the Canadian Federal Department of Transportation, uh, which is a government, Canadian government kind of job in the Federal Department of Transportation. And she finds him perfectly charming. They don and dance, and Ray has become a charmer. Okay, um, now let's halt at that point yeah. while I say you're listening to Dialogue Assassination with Mae Brussel on KLRB Carmel.
and goes to Birmingham, Alabama, and he checks in under the name of John Raines. He sells his, his car back in the States, and he takes the train to Birmingham, and he opens a safe deposit box at the Birmingham National Bank, August the 28th. In that city, he receives a letter from Raoul, and he spends almost $2,000 cash for a car. Raoul keeps the duplicate keys to the car. To the Mustang, and so you would suspect uh, that Raoul might have some interest in that. Well, car. there's a part ownership. Yes, there's a part ownership in that. He passes his Alabama driving test, um, I, and then while in Birmingham, he has a little time and from August through September until October, and he begins to take dancing lessons and joins the Canadian Lonely Hearts Club. He has a correspondence going back up there, <laughs> and he takes a locksmith course by correspondence, and then he orders some very expensive camera equipment, Kodak projector, a camera with a zoom lens, and remote cables, and he's he's fitted out with a lot of, um, it's a Kodak dual projector, a Kodak Super 8 camera, zoom lens, an HBI combination 8mm super splicer, 20-foot uh, remote control cable. This boy uh, never tells what he does with all that camera equipment, but he orders all of that through the mail. He has a lot of things going through the mail, but nobody has, is checking or looking for this particular all person. All of this in addition to buying a $2,000 car. And all of this has come out of his income as a dishwasher at $400 well, a month for three months. He claims that Raoul is supporting him. The important thing is he's being financed for something, even just drug traffic. But how drug traffic connects with being behind the Lorraine Motel is, is it questionable. You see, it's possible that a guy... It's possible that you can make that money and spend that money bringing drugs, say, from Canada, the United States, and down to Mexico and back and forth like he was doing. That is possible. But the connection of him being at the Lorraine Motel when he's never been in that town or been political or involved in any political groups, he's just doing a drug thing. To kill Martin Luther King, he was in a drug scene, you see. <laughs> was any effort made to find out who this Raoul is or to track him down? Well, I have a list of the connections of Raoul, uh, the researchers have tracked them down, the FBI won't. <laughs> the, reason, the FBI won't talk to us. Um, James Ray leaves Birmingham, Alabama, and goes to the Mexican border at Nuevo Laredo, and then Acapulco, and Guadala Puerto Vallarta, and Guadalajara, and he spends 19 days at the resort hotels. Um, in November, he goes to Los Angeles and does some more dancing lessons, and then he leaves for New Orleans, to meet Raoul in New Orleans. He met him at Birmingham once, and he's to meet him in New Orleans. And this is the trip to New Orleans that Louis Lomax was interested in. He is a writer, had a radio program in Los Angeles, and uh, he was interested in the death of Martin Luther King. And he was putting together the Raoul scene in New Orleans, and that was the connection to the Canal Street and Lee Harvey Oswald. Where's Louis Lomax now? His car was turned over in New Mexico, and he was dead, and the researchers have every reason to believe he was killed, along with the many, many other people who get too snoopy into this particular subject. So in 1968, this was December, he left for New Orleans, and in January 1968, James Ray shows up in Los Angeles at a self-improvement specialist uh, the International Society of Hypnosis. And this is very important because of the Sirhan case, the mind lock. He shakes his head when you get into anything regarding the ambassador or teller, the whole scene. And he seems to be programmed to not remember anything that happened. He just shakes his head. Yeah, I know Sirhan admitted a lot of incriminating things, but there are huge blank areas in his mind where he, he can only shake his head and he can't give you details on things. Uh, he will admit shooting Senator Robert Kennedy, he thinks he did, Well, but there are so many areas where he just can't remember this and he can't remember that about things that happened up to that point. That's right. Well, he remembers... This is what's led to the speculation that he was kind of like a, or a his hypnotic context, robot or something. his contacts before. That's right. Everything yeah. is just, he's shaking his head. When he, uh, James Ray was arrested in London, he had the book, How to Cash In on Your Hidden Memory Powers, and I think that if his memory stays hidden, he'll cash in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They already are made a deal, you know, for his parole. And I think one reason for the news to say that Martin Luther King was killed by a sniper is to let the next generation of the people coming up who affect changes not get too excited if he's out. You know, he was a, the name isn't heavy in people's minds, and they're not going to want to associate it with this particular crime. Well, he has this book, How to Cash In on Your Hidden Memory Powers, and then he goes to bartending school. 
This is in Los Angeles in January. Now, he was in Los Angeles from January to March, but there's an interim there where somebody else with the same name that he was using was in Birmingham, Alabama, because the standard station has a green, there were green stamps in his car traced to the gas station in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, and the gas station fixed this white Mustang for clutch trouble, and he had an automatic, and this was a clutch problem. There were two white Mustangs that were identical. And one was filled with cigarette butts, and one didn't have any, he didn't smoke, and one had a clutch, and the other was an automatic. And while he, his chronology says he didn't leave Los Angeles, there was somebody receiving another driver's license there. Well, under, which was the white Mustang they found at the murder scene? I mean, well, I don't that, know. That they connected with the murder. <laughs> I don't know. They don't identify it like there were two rifles, two guns in the Los Angeles Police Department, two serial numbers, with, you know, the two serial numbers listed, and I have different numbers attributed to Sirhan's weapon, but I don't have the license of these Mustangs. We don't know where he is, but James said he was in L.A. through this period. And in 1968, he was at a nose surgeon's, plastic surgeon, where he had his face fixed. And the surgeon didn't recognize his famous client until James Ray was arrested in England. And then when the writers and researchers wa went to his office, he had the after pictures of James Ray, not the before. Now, all plastic surgeons uh, keep a file on all their patients with before and after photographs. But by some coincidence, this specific file was missing. Uh, James Earl Ray's before pictures were missing, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, we, we talk about almost every show, we bring up important parts of political assassinations and always involve some piece of evidence that was missing. So one day we'll do a whole show on evidence missing in, in conspiracy murder trials, just like we mentioned one item here, the surgeon's uh, pictures of James Ray. Now, while he was having his face fixed in Los Angeles, he got a duplicate car license under the name of Eric Starbo Galt. Somebody wrote and asked for another license um, in Montgomery, Alabama. He was in Los Angeles and had his license, and a second license was issued to Eric Starbo Galt in Montgomery, Alabama. Is everyone thoroughly confused by now? He returns to New Orleans and then Selma, Alabama, and then Birmingham and Atlanta, Georgia. Now, you see, he's never in Memphis until the day of the murder of Martin Luther King. Uh, Galt went with Raoul, his friend, in March, just a week before the murder of Martin Luther King, and bought a high-velocity rifle in Birmingham. And he left Atlanta, Georgia, in this Mustang and went to Corinth, Mississippi, and practiced with the new rifle and was using the name Galt. On April the 3rd, he checked into the Memphis, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, at the Rebel Motel. On April the 3rd. And on April the 4th, he changed to another hotel, rooming house, behind the Lorraine Motel. Now, Martin Luther King was scheduled to stay at another place, too. And this is a, a source of investigation which the federal government doesn't care to go into either. And then his arrangements were switched. And they were switched by a member of the black community, a well-known part of the Martin Luther King entourage. And there are members of the Southern community, Mr. Stoner, particular in particular, who says that Martin Luther King was killed by the FBI and by black people, friends of Martin Luther King's, that they helped them, that that he helped was set him up, set him up, and the I have been given the name of a particular person as a suspect that that many black people that are into this field was the one who helped to in Martin Luther King. He did have arrangements to stay at another hotel. And it was switched to the Lorraine Motel. And it would be interesting to know, I don't have a prior investigator, but it would be interesting for those people who have access or if I have enough money someday to get somebody to find out the exact location of the original place he was to stay and to check out if it backed up to the Rebel Motel where... Yeah, because for some reason uh, James Earl Ray was at the Rebel, and then he changed his reservation so that he would be right across from the, from the Lorraine. And he was never in the town before in his life. He makes a good getaway from a police blockade and so gets out of the somehow he had to be aware of the fact that Martin Luther King's hotel arrangements had been changed, that Martin Luther King would be staying at the Lorraine so that he could change his reservations and, and be at a, a nearby right. place. And the day before he bought these binoculars, you know, well, who was he going to watch? Well, he had to see, he knew what he was going to do, and he stalled Martin Luther King very carefully. But he had never been in the town before, so he had to get directions. This is a conspiracy, you see. Who was moving him 
over to the other place because somebody had to know the Martin Luther King was changing his directions. If Ray was doing it alone, he didn't have a pipeline to where Martin Luther King switched or how he would know. Now, Martin Luther King was killed April the 4th, 1968. And then the escape attempt of James Ray begins. We first have the background of his childhood and his bungling, everything he did. Then the life of uh, spending between twenty and fifty thousand dollars in the interim, in those year and a half interim of going to Mexico, Canada, resorts, Puerto of a lot on the beach, bartending, dancing, contacts back and forth, thousands of miles on his and car. And at no time uh, is there any evidence of his having been employed other than that three months, a little over three months, as a dishwasher at four hundred dollars a month. And he was never. And he spent something like fifty thousand dollars back and forth around the country. But uh, then he left. It went to Atlanta, Georgia. And he left his car in Atlanta, Georgia, after Martin Luther King was dead. And there were no fingerprints in the car at all. It was white, clean of fingerprints, but this particular car was one that had cigarette butts, and he didn't smoke. Did they mention whether it was stick shift or automatic? Uh, it. I believe that this was the stick shift, and his was, I have to look that up at home. I have Is all this where they details. found the green stamps in that car? Later, after, yeah. Oh, and well, they then. dated back to the earlier time that he'd been there when he said he was in Los Angeles. And there was another person that used this car that had the set of keys, so we really don't know um, who was using the car. But they were able to take the numbers on the green stamps that were found in the car and trace that back to the service station and find out that those green stamps had been given for a clutch job. A clutch job. So that would indicate that this is the car that had the stick yeah. shift. And, and there were two identical Mustangs involved. Well, he left his car with not one fingerprint, and he took the bus to Cincinnati. And in that interim, he also went to Mexico. And then he's to go to Canada. Now, the, after Martin Luther King is killed, the borders aren't checked, and Canada and Mexico would be two logical places to look for the suspect of Martin Luther King, and he was in both places. Yeah, I would say after a major killing like that, you would uh, think that he was moving around awfully freely. Yeah, absolutely, and then he goes to Canada, <clears throat> Toronto, and he gets a birth certificate under the name of Bridgman. How did he get that? I don't know. He It was delivered to him. The story goes, to cover up the issuance of this, that he went to the library and looked up the newspaper records of when a particular man was born and fit his name. But this would be pretty slick. He got passport photo under the name of Bridgman, bought theatrical supplies, disguise kits, and using Sneed as an alias, he also got a passport under that name. And he used that one and not the Bridgman one. He had these, these official passports, but he chose the one of Sneed, and he went on his way to London. And he got to London May the 7th, and he flew the next day to Lisbon to the Hotel Portugal. And then he, stayed, he went to the Texas Bar and the California Bar. Those were the saloons, not the bar associations. He didn't turn himself <laughs> yes. in. The Texas Bar and the California Bar. And he went to the Canadian Embassy there, and he changed his, po his passport. Um, there was a spelling on that. He changed it to Sneed. And then he went back to London. He was with a company with another man. Uh, people who were with him in London said he was sarcastic about the death of Robert Kennedy. He was with a blonde American on June the 8th. He was in the London airport. He'd come back from Portugal, and he didn't intend to stay in London. And he had a ticket, and he was en route either to Brussels or Paris. Now, it seems to me that when he was arrested that they would know where he's going because the ticket said one or the other. Like, he isn't going either to Munich or Florence. I mean, if he was arrested with an air ticket and he's about to catch, it would be easy to trace and maybe follow up where, who would receive him at the other end. But that was never gone into either. And... He was arrested, and he was brought home. He was arrested by? By Scotland Yard. Not the FBI. No. Or... And then when he was arrested, he had the name of three famous attorneys in the United States to call upon, and Mr. Haynes was chosen as the attorney. for. He's from the South, and he was chosen as the attorney for Martin Luther King until two days before the hearing, and then he was discharged. He was going to say that... that um, James Ray was innocent of the killing. Haynes can see no connection between the bullet that's in Martin Luther King and the particular gun that was used behind the hotel. Aha, uh -huh. now we come to a real mystery, because <laughs> after all of this traveling around and all this creation of a tangle of confusion uh, so that it would be almost impossible to trace him back, the there's suspicion no that maybe all of this cover-up was done and James Earl Ray actually was not the killer. That, oh... 
That's right. And now I want to suggest that uh, everybody get the Esquire magazine of this month, March issue. It's a marvelous article, and I would just wish I had time to read the whole thing on the air, which I don't. It's impossible. It's called, Are You Sure Who Killed Martin Luther King? And that's in the March issue of Esquire magazine. Yeah, and, and people should get it by the Esquire or go to the library and Xerox the six pages because it goes into a lot of the chronology that I've talked about, about Martin Luther King, and it goes into the fact that Mr. Haynes wanted to represent Martin Luther King, but two and days... James Earl Ray, right? James Earl Ray, I keep saying Martin Luther King. Uh, two days before the trial was to take place, Percy Foreman from Houston, Texas, was sent in. And then James Ray pleaded an altogether different story. Well, did James Earl Ray request Percy Foreman? Nobody knows how Percy Foreman got in on the on the case. And because Houston, Texas is such a center of CIA funds and institutions and foundations, it would be very important to know if Percy Foreman in any way is related to these CIA foundations. I know that Leon Jaworski, the president of the American Bar Association, is on the board of directors of a CIA foundation in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. And the woman, uh, Sarah Hughes, the lawyer who swore in Lyndon Johnson, is a board of directors, a lawyer for the CIA foundation in Houston, Texas when administered the oath of Johnson after the killing of John Kennedy. But at this hearing, uh, they had a about 19-minute hearing before the judge where James Earl Ray uh, gave up his chance for a trial. Uh, James Ray said, he spoke up and interrupted the, the judge, and he was very angry. And he said, Your Honor, I would like to say something. I don't want to change anything I've said. I want to enter one other thing. And that is, I can't agree with Mr. Clark. Ramsey Clark was the Attorney General of the United States who kept insisting publicly that the King assassination was the work of one man acting alone. Ramsey Clark got on the air the day after the Martin Luther King assassination and said there was no conspiracy at all. That's the, the head of the Justice Department, the whole United States. But James Earl Ray in court said, I don't agree with that. That's right. But the, the head of the Justice Department, the district, you know, of the whole United States, didn't even have a suspect, and he's telling you there was absolutely no conspiracy, and even the Almanac of 1970 tells you about the obvious conspiracy to kill Martin Luther King. Well, at the time, James Earl Ray said in court, Your Honor, I don't agree with uh, Ramsey Clark. Did anybody say, well, what do you mean? Well, what? Did anybody question him oh, as no. to what the conspiracy in his mind was? Or? No. Ray said, Ray spoke up before Ray could be hushed. It was clear that he was disagreeing with Clark and Canale, who was a chief prosecutor, in saying there was no conspiracy. And his outburst subsequently was to add to public confusion over this point. I would think so, yes. Yeah, he was saying, uh, I don't agree with the fact that there was no conspiracy. Now, uh, the case lasted 144 minutes. And Esquire has, uh, says it has been established that the prosecution at this time is not in possession of enough evidence to indict anyone as a co-conspirator in this case. And, of course, this is not conclusive evidence. There was no conspiracy. But they promised to open up the case if ever a conspiracy appeared. But so many researchers are finding evidence of a conspiracy, but this prosecutor hasn't found it yet. So there's nothing to open up. And if the FBI hasn't found it, then they're never going to open it They up. don't appear to be looking too hard. They haven't checked into any of these obvious things that uh, would occur to every listener who's hearing this program. Well, it, it seems so obvious. that Now, the law firm of Haynes & Haynes, their father and son, are in Birmingham, Alabama. And Mr. Haynes was said he was nominated in London as being a second choice to represent um, James Earl Ray. And Mr. Haynes was not a friend of Martin Luther King. As a former mayor of Birmingham, Alabama, he had his troubles with the black leader, and he successfully defended white Southerners in race cases. But Haynes knew Ray inside and out. And I'm quoting Esquire, that Haynes got the largest share of his earnings of a book that was to be written about Ray, that uh, Huey was writing, Bradford Huey. And it says, Haynes had no reason to assert that the Martin Luther King assassination was a conspiracy, except that he believes it. He no longer represents Ray in any capacity. He is an old FBI man himself, and he's able to look at evidence with an absolutely detached eye. 
And yet he says with a fervent conviction, I'll state flatly right now that James Earl Ray did not fire the shot that killed Martin Luther King. There were real plotters. There, he was a dupe in that conspiracy. Haynes, here's a lawyer who has represented the people not sympathetic to Martin Luther King, an ex-FBI man examining the evidence. He claims the bullet that killed Dr. King, a perfect evidence bullet, was not fired from the gun that Ray bought, and he contends that the evidence in the doorway dropped was not dropped by Ray, but by somebody else, and that the state's case against Ray was not sufficient for a first-degree murder charge, and he has confidence that if he had, had gone to the jury, he would have had a mistrial. In, in at least his opinion, there was not sufficient evidence even to bring Ray to trial. Not even bring... Yeah, he said... Um, they asked him who had the brains, the intelligence, and the know-how to conceive this plot. And Haynes said only two groups could do it, the black militants and the CIA. Well, up to this point, Mr. Haynes never gave the black people any brains or intelligence for anything. Mm -hmm. So he, he, all of a sudden he thinks they can conceive a plot that goes beyond the FBI and Reagan, you know, they can manage this whole thing that the black people could move a man like James Ray to to kill Martin Luther King, that's hardly possible. But the other choice, he says, is the CIA. And he says, it sounds terrible for an old patriotic fellow like me to talk about the CIA, but that's the way he feels it, and he feels that, that this plot, it was a conspiracy and that Ray was used. He says, James Earl Ray did not fire the shot. He was a man who loved to go out at night, sip vodka and orange juice, go with the girls at the bar, pick them up, he made a good escape from the penitentiary, covered his tracks. He was living good. He was within the clutches of the law. He owed them 18 years, and he got away. And he said, they're using James Earl Ray. The gun that he bought in Birmingham at the Aero Marine Supply was taken from Ray on Tuesday night in a little motel in Mississippi prior to the shooting of Dr. King on Thursday, and Ray never saw that gun again. He was given a slip of paper and said, check in at the rooming house, 422 South Main Street in Memphis at 3 o'clock Thursday afternoon. Now, this is what Haynes is saying, and he spent more time with Ray than any other single person. Who, who gave him that slip of paper that told him to yes, check into... James Ray told his attorney, Haynes, that he got a slip of paper. And as was typical of James Earl Ray, he got lost. He parked his car a mile and a half from the rooming house. He got there at 3.20. He checked in. And his contact came to him and dispatched him up the street to get binoculars. He brought the binoculars back, laid them in the suitcase, and he was told to get his car and bring it down and put it in front of the rooming house. Go down and have a beer in Jim's Grill underneath here and wait for me. And the only witness to the state had to this particular case was a Charlie Stevens. And Haynes says that Stevens is, was drunk all the time. He was no more witness than I was. This is Haynes in the Esquire article. He was no more witness than I was, and Haynes had another witness, Stephen's friend, whose name was Grace Walden, and her description of who left the place after the murder of Martin Luther King no way fit James Earl Ray, but Grace Walden disappeared and was committed to a state mental hospital, and Haynes interviewed there. And, and Haynes said about the gun, that is not the gun that fired and shot Martin Luther King, and the state should never, could never show that it did, and this particular woman is locked up as being crazy. We don't know where she is now. She was never seen. He saw her at this mental institution. And because the man... A witness who could testify that the man who left the, the murder scene was not James Earl Ray. Yeah. And she is now in a mental institution. Who committed her? Well, you know, if this, I, I don't know who committed her because there's so many unanswered questions. But if this sounds far-fetched to the listeners, that a woman could be of value in pointing out the man who left the rooming house and that she's committed... Uh, I have to refer back to the show we did, was it a week ago, on Thomas Noguchi, the coroner in Los Angeles. That's exactly what they attempted to do with him. He uh, was a doctor, a man who went through medical school, who did the autopsy on um, uh, Robert Kennedy, and it was in June 1968, and the Board of Supervisors in the city of Los Angeles gave him a commendation for this wonderful autopsy that he did was so thorough and complete. And it stated that Robert Kennedy was murdered one inch from the back of the head by a gunman standing an inch from the back of the head. And one year later, uh, the same Board of Supervisors in the city of Los Angeles fired him from being a coroner 
on the grounds that he was insane, and they had a list of charges that he danced over the bodies and laughed and giggled and took gr drugs and hoped the planes would crash, large jets. Well, they had a whole parade of witnesses saying Louis. just really outrageous things. That's right, him. and fired him, a medical doctor, for being insane. So if you can get away with doing that, Thomas Taguchi was later restated because he got... Well, he spent every penny of his resources in defending himself in against the these charges. He had money and a family and savings, and he had to use it all up to prove that he wasn't crazy. But apparently this poor woman who was a witness to no the Martin Luther King murder witness... Uh, uh, oh, wow. There's no one like Godfrey Isaac, the attorney that represented, um, you know, Thomas Taguchi in Los Angeles. There's no one that spoke up or represented this woman and found out why she's locked away. And Haynes says that she's locked away. And J.B. Stoner, the attorney in the South for the state's right, the National States Rights Party, an admitted racist, uh, he's in the anti-Jewish party, he hates the Jews, he hates the blacks, uh, he wishes all the Jews were removed from this country. Stoner's campaign manager was Jerry L. Ray, brother of James Earl Ray. And uh, he was always marked for violence and followed around. He was arrested for shooting a 17-year-old boy recently. Mr. Stoner is now a candidate for the United States Senate. But Mr. Stoner said that um, he visits Ray all the time. He goes into the jail, and he, and he has access to Ray now. He has become one of the lawyers of James Earl Ray for the National States Ray Rights Party. And he said, in quotes, Ray was a pawn a decoy in a conspiracy planned and carried out by the agencies of the United States government, and the conspirators were using some of King's own people. They asked him specifically, do you mean the FBI was responsible for King's death? And he says, yes. Stoner has been warring with, warring with the FBI for years. They came to him with, as an undercover agent and offered him $25,000 to kill King at one time, and he turned it down. And Stoner mentions the government agencies, and Mr. Haynes mentions them. So if May Russell is saying this, it's not that I'm after any particular group. There's another political spectrum at the other side, way over at the other side of where I'm thinking, who are saying these things. And all of these statements that May has been making, which may be really blowing your mind, are in Esquire magazine, the March edition. Uh, there's about a six-page article there that you can pick up and read for yourself in a national publication <laughs> that says all these things that May has been reading here. Are you sure who killed Martin Luther King? That's the title. And the author of that article is... Bynum Shaw. Bynum Shaw. Are you sure who killed Martin Luther King? I think uh, after this past hour, we're sure of one thing. Who didn't kill Martin Luther King? And we're sure that... Uh, Aside from a few research specialists and a handful of concerned people around the country, nobody is really trying to find out who killed Martin Luther King, as nobody is really too concerned about a thorough investigation into who killed Robert Kennedy, who killed John Fitzgerald Kennedy, well, that's let right. alone people like Louis Lomax. Well, a few hundred others we can name. Malcolm X and so on down the line. Uh, let alone the little people who have died, uh, innocent people. Because they happen to be in the hallway of a building. Or who have been committed to mental institutions or, or, or fates even worse. So while you tend your gardens this week, think about what you hear and try to be political as well as uh, horticultural, you know. Combine the two. They, they go hand in glove. Okay, we'll be back again next week with Dialogue Assassination with May Brussel. And May, you said something about uh, perhaps devoting a whole program to provocateurs. Yeah, next week I think I'll take Louis Tacqua in Los Angeles and Frank Martinez from the Mexican-American commu community and show uh, the effects of the death of Martin Luther King, the riots and, that followed, and the deaths and the pillaging and murder. When Martin Luther King was killed, the effect was to have Spiro Agnew as the law and order candidate of vice president and in order to get that, you use provocateurs to set fire to buildings. And we'll talk about the follow-up of James Ray in terms of the provocateurs that brought the chaos and the riots that brought more repression following the political effect of the death of Martin Luther King in this country. As a newsman, I'm aware that quite frequently at peace demonstrations or, or demonstrations of various natures uh, uh, where people will outrage the general public by 
desecrating the American flag, urinating on the flag, things like that. Uh, you're properly outraged by acts like this, and quite frequently these acts are committed by agents of your government. And the reason they're doing it is to outrage you and to make you angry with the groups that these people have infiltrated and become associated with. And then you allow them more weapons to gain more control and more wiretapping and bugging. And, more and, and so instead of identifying it as an agent of your government who's doing these things, you say those Black Panthers have to be stopped, those, those SDS people have to be stopped and all this sort of thing, and uh, you give the government more power to come down on them without realizing that that kind of power is very, very dangerous and could be turned on you. This faceless government, yeah. So that's what we'll be discussing next week on Dialogue Assassination with May Brussel. Mm -hmm.